I'd like to call this Saline City Council meeting to order. If you'd please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, members present this evening are myself, Mayor Marl, Council Members Gearbaugh, Rhodes, Roth, Tahar, and Dillon. Ms. Saibo Koenig will be absent this evening. From city staff, we have City Manager Campbell, Clerk Royal, City Treasurer Bennett, Police Chief Rennick, City Superintendent Engineer Rubel, Parks and Rec Director Scruggs. And for the rest of you who are present this evening, if you'd please sign in in the back to my left, we would appreciate that. Um, you do have two supplementals that were provided by the clerk's office. I believe she also emailed these to you all in advance of tonight's meeting. One is related to the fee book. It's a memo from um, Jeff Fordyce dated um, the 3rd of April, 2015. And the second is a copy of the resolution, which is also on the agenda this evening, I believe, as a new business action item. Okay? Did anybody not receive those two documents? No? Okay. Very good. Then at this time, the chair would seek a motion to approve the agenda as submitted unless there are amendments. Move to approve as submitted. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Rhodes. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Dillon. Thank you, ma'am. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Ayes have not The agenda is approved as submitted. Um, at this time, the chair would seek a motion to uh, excuse the absence of City Councilwoman uh, Terry Saibo Koenig. So, so moved. Thank you, Mr. Gearbaugh, and I'll let Ms. Second. Uh, yeah, thank you, Ms. Tahar be the second. Um, so it was moved by Gearbaugh, seconded by Tahar, to excuse the absence of Councilwoman Saibo Koenig. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Ayes have it. The motion carries unanimously. <clears throat> we have two presentations this evening. The first of which is the 2014 uh, Parks Commission yearly report, and I believe the chairperson, Mr. Neil Mormon, will be presenting. When the screen is loaded and your PowerPoint is up, the floor is yours, my friend. Thank you. I'd like to thank the council and the mayor for allowing us to come in and present this evening a wrap-up of our 2014 activities. <laughs> sure. That just illustrates the degree of fun and excitement that we had at Parks. Well, that, that's not what it looks like here. about that again thank you everyone for allowing us to come in and recap our 2014 uh, year our committee is consisting of myself Neil Mormon the chairman Sheila Burgoyne our vice chair uh, committee members Amy Armstrong Elena Hess Greg Hohenberger Jim Peters and John Phillips uh, city council member David Rhodes is our representative with Jody Roberts as our secretary and Carla Scruggs as our staff liaison uh, excuse me uh, some of the things that we worked on this year, number one was partnering with um, established community groups to put on various events. One of the most noteworthy is our annual Mastodon uh, Mayhem Challenge. It's sort of a mud run, obstacle course run that we put on in conjunction with the Celtic Festival. Uh, we've worked with Celine Main Street, we've worked with the Celtic Festival as well, and we've also worked with a local group known as Workout One to help organize the event, stage it, and then produce the event as we planned. The second thing that we put a lot of effort into every year is our Green Thumb Award. In 2014, we had approximately uh, 20, 29 so uh, nominations. Uh, we had several winners in the business category. We so chose the Celine Senior Center. In residential, we had three winners, Marla DeVries, Mike and Rebecca Godak, 
and Nancy Rogers. Uh, every year we put on this function where community members can submit their neighbors, their friends, or themselves, or a business, uh, based on the appearance of their home, their yard, their landscape, to sort of beautify the city and make it a better place. Uh, this year we'll be selecting nominations in the months of June, July, and August time frame, with the winners announced around September. Uh, next uh, is a new event as of last year, Bark in the Park. Uh, this year we'll be repeating the event June 5th, which happens to also be the first night of Movie in the Park series this summer. Uh, the Bark in the Park allows us to bring, have dog owners come out, utilize the dog park and the obstacle course to do some agility training and show off what their dogs can do. Uh, next is one of our bigger upcoming projects, which is our annual park cleanup. Once a year, we partner with DPW. We select one park, and we put a lot of effort into cleaning it up, beautifying it, and just taking care of some little maintenance things. Uh, we rely heavily on community involvement, and this year's event will be May 9th at Curtis Park at 9 a.m. So that was actually a video that we did recently with the help of Chase from SCTN to put that together and promote the event coming up. So with that, I'd conclude and say thank you for your time and your support throughout the year and look forward to a successful 2015. Are there any questions? Thank you, Neil. Are there any questions for our Parks Commission Chair? No? I, well, Mr. Rhodes, please. No questions, just a comment. I've only been council liaison this year for just a few months now. Parks Commission, but it's been a pleasure to work with all of them. They're, they're a, a, a very passionate group, energetic, and willing to, to uh, get their hands dirty out in the park. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Thank you, Mr. Rhodes. Neil, we appreciate your leadership and your time this evening. I, I guess the one thing that I would ask, and I, I'm actually looking for confirmation on this, I believe you still have one vacancy on the Parks Commission. So for anybody um, in the audience, anybody who will wa be watching this at home, or for anyone on the dais, if you know of a a quality individual who's willing to give their, their time and talent and help promote and enhance our, our parks. I, I hope you encourage them to contact either myself or the city clerk and get in an application. Yes. yes. Wonderful. If that's it, Neil, appreciate your time this evening. Thank you. Thank you kindly. So next up, we have a presentation on Proposal 1, and um, we're very fortunate to have um, Representative Adam Zemke representing the 55th State House District with us this evening. Um, in full disclosure, as all of you know, I am an employee of Representative Zemke, um, and he is not the representative of the City of Saline, but he has worked um, tirelessly on this particular issue and has presented to a number of groups and organizations. Um, and because of his knowledge and enthusiasm, I thought it was appropriate to have him here tonight to talk about Proposal 1, how it came about, and to address any questions and concerns you may have. So, Representative Zemke. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, 
uh, council members. I really appreciate you giving me the time to come and talk with you about this uh, issue. It's a very important issue uh, for all of our uh, residents in Saline and around the state who have the opportunity to vote on it on May 5th. Uh, in full disclosure, uh, I created this presentation on my own time, not utilizing any state resources. And I say that because I am here advocating that you, uh, that you support Proposal 1 uh, with your, uh, any, of, any of the uh, available opportunities that you have. Uh, I uh, voted for the legislation that uh, we passed in the legislature that enabled the belt proposal to happen. Uh, I'm strongly supportive of uh, its efforts. And I think it's a good solution to solve our uh, very much crumbling infrastructure problems. Um, so I'm going to talk with you a little bit about, about why that is. And I'm going to do it in a, in a variety of ways. First, going to frame what the problem looks like. So um, to give you uh, a kind of some of the, the low points of where we're at in our infrastructure, uh, across the state, we have 27% of bridges that, are in rep that need repair, improvement, or replacement. And in our municipalities, particularly in our cities, 48% of roads are in poor or mediocre condition. I think we can attest to the quality of some of our roads here in Washtenaw County. And I can tell you that since I first started becoming involved in, uh, in local uh, government uh, in 2010, there were a number, I think over a dozen or close to a dozen, uh, bridges that needed repair just in the western portion of Washtenaw County alone. So this is a serious problem. This is nothing new. Um, the cost of crashes. This is accidents. Medical costs, productivity costs, workplace costs, travel delays, insurance, and legal costs for residents. The total across, that, uh, across the state for this, just this issue, is $8.1 billion a year. That's a serious financial impact. What does that amount to? Uh, about $357 per driver. And I want to I want to frame this last point here. Roadway conditions are a significant factor, in they are they influence the outcome of approximately one third of traffic fatalities, not just accidents, fatalities. That's a serious issue, and these are things that can be taken from uh, a study that the Michigan Department of Transportation participated in. It's a nationwide study. I'm happy to provide you with the uh, links to that after the presentation is over with. So how do we get there? So there's a lot of blame to go around as to why we're in the, the position we're in. And it is, like most large problems, it is not one significant factor. It's brutal winters. We have a rapid freeze-thaw cycle in Michigan that we know about. Uh, we, because of our uh, lack of investment and lack of annual revenue source, we have had a not a very good approach to repairing roads. We're not, we've not done the right thing because we don't have the revenue to support doing the right thing. Um, we have the highest uh, commercial vehicle weight limits in the, uh, in the country. And uh, I apologize, my Twitter is blowing up. Apparently somebody here is tweeting about this. Um, uh, we also have uh, uh, a significant lack of investment, bottom line. Really, what does that mean? I realize this is a little hard to see here, so I'll explain it. On the far left, we have Minnesota. Per person, they invest $315. Illinois, $235. Ohio, $235. Wisconsin, $231. Indiana, $187. And Michigan, on the far right, $174 per person. Notice these are all surrounding uh, Great Lakes states and uh, Midwest states. And uh, as a result of that, they have very similar climates. Um, and the bottom line is that we have, this speaks to that last point, we have not been investing where we need to. And that's our infrastructure system. So um, let's say we do nothing, no changes. You could see uh, the downward trend of all of these things, both on our, our uh, uh, national, statewide, regional, and local uh, infrastructure systems. They are just going to continue to degrade. There is no leveling off point on this. It just continues to go down. So the cost of doing nothing, increasingly dangerous conditions, and as with any investment, Preventative maintenance is always a cost saver. And we are not able to do preventative maintenance right now with our current revenue stream. And so you have massive long-term costs. This cost is just going to get bigger. Or we have proposal one, which is the option in front of us right now. Uh, this is a very brief summary, and I'm going to explain what all these points are here, because I think you have a right to understand in detail what, the, what they mean. 
uh, fixes Michigan's crumbling roads. It holds harmless and gen even generates a little bit more revenue for uh, public schools and local governments. And it provides tax relief to low-income residents uh, because it does it in a way that is a regressive tax structure. It's a sales tax increase. And so uh, we want to make sure that uh, our, um, some of our families who are uh, especially of low income are not, uh, are protected, basically. And there's a component to this that enables us to do that. So what it does, it generates $1.3 billion in new revenue for our transportation fund. It's a constitutionally protected fund, meaning that the legislature cannot shift the money around uh, and put it elsewhere generates $300 million more for the school aid fund, which is another constitutionally protected fund, meaning that we can't shift it around and put it elsewhere. And it generates $94 million more for local governments. So what is it going to do? Really, this is where the rubber meets the road, if you will. Right now is the top portion, uh, or the, the black portion is what we can do right now under our current revenue streams. 1,079 miles of reconstruction, 2,900 miles of rehabilitation. Under Proposal 1, you could see those numbers of reconstruction over double and uh, in, in both categories, rehabilitation double as well. So. Why is it so complicated? That is the number one question. I've done this presentation nearly a dozen times already. People are confused about this, more so than, than most ballot proposals, which are inherently confusing. Um, and it's really because the current law is, is very confusing and complicated. And so in order to provide a simple solution, I realize this is, this is uh, going to sound very strange, in order to provide a simple solution, you have to have a, a complicated part of the equation to solve the, the complicated part we have right now. So um, under the current law, when you purchase gas or diesel fuel, there are two buckets that you pay into. This is right now, today, no, nothing to do with Proposal 1. We have a fuel tax of 19 cents per gallon or 15 cents per gallon, uh, sorry, 19 cents per gallon on gas or 15 cents per gallon on diesel. And then you have a sales tax component on that 6%. Now that, uh, that bucket on the, uh, on the left there is, uh, is a flat tax. It has not been increased since I think 1998 was the last time, um, but yet we've seen cost of labor and cost of materials increase when uh, when uh, roads are being rebuilt and rehabilitated. Uh, so you have, you have a, essentially a flat stream of revenue right there. Uh, you also have uh, a sales tax, which is indexing, but uh, there's a problem with this. And that is that the majority of that sales tax doesn't go to fixing our infrastructure system. Um, and so only about 15% of it does. The balance goes to things that I think are important, local government and schools. But that means that we have a problem with our stream of revenue uh, off of gas. And so uh, this is where Proposal 1 creates, uh, uh, is complicated in order to provide a simple solution. What it does, uh, well, here's the, I'll, I'll go into this here. Uh, fuel tax being flat while costs rise, that's a continued problem. Current sales tax structure on fuel rises with inflation, but dedicates very little revenue to uh, road maintenance and repair. So, question, why didn't we just raise the gas tax? That was a proposal set before the legislature. Uh, it was passed in the Senate, and I'll be very honest with you, uh, it had uh, a number of us that were willing to support it in the House. It didn't pass because there weren't enough votes. You had 56 votes in the House, 20 votes in the Senate, and one gubernatorial signature uh, in order to, pat, to put something from bill form into law form. And there were not 56 votes in the House. And that's where the problem came into, came into play. So uh, that, that proposal would have done it, wouldn't have required a ballot proposal. But I'll tell you, there's, there's one thing that that, that proposal would, would not do that Proposal 1 does. I've been asked more times than I can count, why is it that my money that I spend on vehicle registrations and on fuel doesn't go to the transportation infrastructure? All of the revenue should be dedicated from those two things, which are arguably transportation uh, generating revenue sources uh, or revenue generating sources, it should go to fund our transportation infrastructure. And if that were the case, if all of it did, then we wouldn't have the problem that we have right now. But because, uh, as you saw in that previous pie chart, it does not, in fact, the majority of it does not, 
we have a problem. So proposal one seeks to do that. It seeks to dedicate and constitutionally protect um, all of the revenue that is of a transportation nature. So your vehicle registrations and your fuel taxation and put it towards your infrastructure fund and, that, and constitutionally protect that fund. Uh, so um, basically here's what, here's what we're looking at doing. In total, that $1.3 billion is $1.2 billion for roads, bridges, repair, and bridges, uh, and then $100 million for mass transit. That goes through something called the Act 51 formula. It was established in 1951. It's the structure by, uh, by way transportation funding is disseminated between the Michigan Department of Transportation, the uh, county road commissions, and local governments. And so uh, there's not been a, a change proposed in this fund. There, there has not been a, a successful change to that structure since 1951. So what we're talking about is this new dedicated fuel tax. That's where a significant amount of this revenue comes into play. And then you have a change in registration fees. Right now, on new vehicles, we're talking about, I want you to look at that cars and electric cars. On new vehicles, let's say you go out and you purchase a $30,000 Jeep Grand Cherokee. I don't know if that's what a Jeep Grand Cherokee costs these days, but let's say, as a hypothetical, $30,000 for a new Jeep Grand Cherokee. You go and register that Grand Cherokee with the Secretary of State, and you're going to pay approximately $153 for that first year registration, vehicle registration fee. It's going to then depreciate for the next four years and flatten out down to $111. What we're talking about in this change in cars and electric car vehicle registrations, it eliminates that depreciation. So you could say that's an effectively an increase. It is. Um, but it's one of those things where if you go on year two or three, you're just not going to see that depreciation. It's not going to go above that 153. It's just going to stay flat. The one difference to that is that if you purchase a new electric car, and uh, there's going to be a slight upcharge, and it's going to be a $25 fee. It's not going to be a $25 fee new every year. It's just going to be a $25 fee. Uh, and so um, the big area of change when it comes to vehicle registrations is in the commercial vehicle sector. And I'll tell you, part of that reason that, that electric cars are handled a little bit differently is we're doing some really uh, innovative things with hybrid vehicle technology uh, on the west side of the state in commercial vehicles. Commercial vehicles do the majority of the, uh, of the damage to our roads. It's a simple fact because they weigh more uh, on average. And uh, we wouldn't want um, heavyweight commercial vehicles with hybrid technology getting a break on the registration fee increases. So that's part of the reason that that second category, that middle category is there as well. But the big bulk of the registration fee increases come in the commercial vehicle sector. And really that is because right now there's a significant gap. The majority of passenger cars are paying uh, rates that in terms of their damage to the roads are very high versus the amount of damage that a heavier weight vehicle does. I'll put my engineering hat on for a second. And uh, really, when you look at weight versus degradation to roads, it's an exponential function. It's not a linear function. So uh, a very heavy weight vehicle is going to do exponentially greater damage to roads than passenger cars. It's going to take several thousand passenger cars, in fact, to do the same amount of damage. But our vehicle registration fees are not reflecting that. And so that's why, under Proposal 1, you would have these changes. So. The other thing I hear about, other than dedicate all of our revenue, uh, our transportation-related revenue to uh, road repair and, uh, and the transportation fund, is that the legislature is just going to take that money and shift it around. And, uh, and what I'm here to tell you is that under Proposal 1, that can't happen. These are constitutionally protected. Uh, so you would have to change the Constitution, I guess. I, I will put that disclaimer in. If you wanted to change the Constitution, if you could get the votes to do that, uh, to undedicate the revenue, then, um, then that is a possibility. But I think that the likelihood of that is very, very, very slim. Um, and uh, so this money would be funneled right into that transportation fund. And uh, as a result of that, you would have significantly more revenue, $1.3 billion more annually. Um, the reason that we're looking at a sales tax change is, if you look back at that, you remember that pie chart I showed you that was multicolored? showed that only 15% of the revenue went to the transportation fund, 75% went to schools, and 10% to local governments. We have to replace that revenue. 
we're, we're dedicating all of this, those, essentially those two pie charts, to the transportation fund. We've got to figure out a way to backfill the sales tax losses to schools and local governments. That's where Proposal 1 comes into play, because it's a sales tax increase. So we're essentially taking the money out of one bucket, we're putting it in a constitutionally protected other bucket, and then we've got to refill that, that bucket that we took from originally. So this is what the sales tax goes to. It refills the school bucket to the tune of $1 billion, which is what would be taken, and it adds $300 million more for local governments. It refills that bucket and it adds $94 million. And then, because it is inherently uh, a regressive tax structure, sales taxes, it's going to hit those or take a larger percentage of the income of those who make less, we increase the earned income tax credit, which literally is a tax credit for the working poor. That is the best way to describe it. It was previously at, uh, allowed to be claimed at 20% of the income. Um, under the tax shift, when the when the uh, current governor came into office in 2011, uh, that 20% went down to 6%. And so we're talking about increasing that back up to 20%. It's a 14% increase. So what does this cost? On average, according, uh, according to nonpartisan uh, House fiscal analysis, um, it will cost the average family $195 per household annually. That's the cost of Proposal 1 per household. With the EITC, at 20%, recipients will be able to claim $333 per household a year. So your simple math is $138 more per household. So it's still a regressive tax structure, but we're putting in a step to ensure that it's not hitting those, uh, those uh, folks who are, who are making the least amount of income. So in summary, because I realize this is a lot, Proposal 1, if it passes, generates 1.3 million or 1.3 billion rather more annually for for the constitutionally protected transportation fund it backfills those buckets in school uh, in the school aid fund and to local governments to the tune of 300 million and 94 million respectively and it adds in this earned income tax credit to offset the cost in a sales tax uh, in a rising sales tax on working poor families so ask yourself do you want to dedicate all the money that you spend taxation-wise on your car, registrations, gas or diesel fuel tax, you will want all that money to go to a constitutionally protected fund for transportation? If you want that, that's what I hear from most residents, the answer is yes, Proposal 1 does that. Do, I, do you want schools to have some more revenue? Do you want that to be constitutionally protected? Do you want local governments to have some more revenue? If so, then, the, then Proposal 1 does that. I mean, and are you tired of legislators saying, we're just going to raise more money into the general fund and then it not getting to where you think it needs to go? If the answer is yes, Proposal 1 does that. It's generating more revenue for constitutionally protected sources. It's dedicated. That's the right thing to do. It's what residents continue to ask for. And so I would encourage you all to vote yes on May 5th, and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions that you have, because I realize this is a very complicated proposal. Well, thank you, Representative Zemke. That's very thorough. One quick question before I open it up to the group, and, and I know you have heard this, and, and probably everyone at the dais has heard this from the people we represent. Um, the state has a multi-billion dollar budget, tens upon tens of millions of dollars in the general fund alone. Yep. Why can't you just work on some reforms and some consolidations and some cost savings, cost saving measures to generate the kind of funds needed for our roads. Do you want to address that and, and debunk that, that myth, if you will? I would absolutely like to address that. Um, and I appreciate the question, because this is a very uh, common and respectful question as well. Um, I sit as, uh, stand here as a member of the Appropriations Committee, too. I've sat in the Appropriations Committee for over two years now, uh, looking at various uh, department budgets. And uh, the state has a 53, just about $53.2 billion uh, that it collects in taxation every year. That's a lot of money. In the general fund, there's only about $10 billion. So the rest of it are those constitutionally protected funds or dedicated funds that we can't touch to do things like this. We could not shift the money out of other areas outside of the general fund to road repair. Uh, it just could not happen. And so when you're talking about 
the need to generate $1.2, $1.5 billion more, that's 10 15% of the general fund. You're, you can't find that type of cost savings without some significant cuts in services. It's, it's not there in waste. You're going to find waste maybe in the uh, tens of thousands, you know, and, and collectively in maybe the, the low hundreds of thousands, not in the millions or billions that you need in order to generate these. It's just not there. You're talking about 10 to 15 percent of the general fund revenue just in additional revenue for this proposal alone. That's what you would need. It's just not there. Thank you. I appreciate your answer on that question. Um, are there other questions for Representative Zemke? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Rhodes. Um, two, if I could. Yes. Uh, the first one is, uh, if this proposal passes, when does it go into effect? So um, when we voted on the time of this legislation back in December, um, the governor had secured um, the ability to bond to start road repair within two weeks after the ballot measure. So that's when the repair would start. It phases in. And the reason that we are bonding uh, is because of that phase in. You're talking about over a three year period, it's going to gener generate that $1.3 billion. So I don't think residents would accept the fact that they're going to be uh, immediately spending more on a sales tax increase without having their road repair done starting right away. I think that's a very justifiable expectation. And the only way to do that is to do the bonding uh, mechanism that the governor has secured. So that's the answer to your first question. Thank you. Yeah, the second question is on the earned income tax credit. Yeah. Is that a tax credit that also phases in to get to the 20 percent, or is that an immediate? No, that's an immediate 20 percent. That's an immediate increase. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Mr. Gearbaugh? Just a couple. Um, just some clarification. Although you said that this money will be constitutionally protected, so that it goes for these uses, it doesn't prevent the government or the state legislature from reducing funding that already currently is in the general fund and moving it into other areas, correct? That is true. That is true. So they could offset by this amount of money that's just been approved. You could offset it, but there's actually not, even if you look at the school aid fund, uh, so the, the, the lower of the constitutionally protected funds um, in terms of the, the revenue increases, uh, there's not $300 million in, of general fund dollars into the school aid fund. Uh, and so you would have to, or school aid budget rather, sorry. Um, you would have to, you could take out all that general fund and you would still have an increase uh, into the school aid uh, budget. But, it's not, but it still wouldn't be a supplement to the degree of what you're saying, 300 million? It wouldn't be 300 million, it would be less. It would probably be in the neighborhood of right around 150 million. Um, but I would argue that the reason, for, uh, the reason for constitutionally protected funds is so that you don't have to have a reliance on general fund revenues because you don't want to have to worry about the, that general fund balance affecting things that, that uh, you care about necessarily or less. So ideally it would be, it's to our benefit to constitutionally protect as much funding as possible. Uh, oh, I agree. For and things I think, that we... I think if they were to propose it this way, with that into it, um, that probably would make it yeah. even more sellable. Um, the other one, as we always keep hearing about the tax credits and like $10 billion worth of the tax credits, yeah. how will those be funded? Because those can only be funded through revenue from the general fund. So I'm expecting either either a high increase of additional revenue coming in, which that doesn't seem to be the case, or they're going to be shifting more funds again, and where would those come from? Right. <clears throat> so the, uh, the tax credits are actually pretty well accounted for under the current uh, proposed fiscal year 16 budget. So the fiscal year 16 budget that we just passed out of subcommittee this past, uh, or week, a week ago, in fact, um, does not take into account any increases in proposal, that proposal one may provide. So the current revenue that the state is taking in um, from taxpayers takes into account those mega credits that you're referring to. Um, and so proposal one would be over and above all of that. The, the numbers that I gave you are over and above what the state's budget is right now, in, in accounting for those tax credits. And then just curi curiosity, um, when you talked about the commercial vehicles and how much percentage of the additional revenue is associated with that fee increase to those commercial vehicles, is it? 10 million, 300 million? Uh, I th that's a very good question. Uh, it's in the neighborhood of three to 400 million. Um, I can get you the exact answer, but I don't have it offhand. I just want to make sure it's that significant. Cause yeah, it's, it's very significant. Yeah. Okay. Thank so. you. Anything um, else, Mr. Gearbaugh? No, not at this point. Anything else for Representative Zemke? No, Representative, again, we appreciate your time very much. Thank you kindly.
Thank you for the time. Thanks. I appreciate it. Okay, moving on on the agenda this evening, my friends, we come to citizen comments on agenda items. Under the Open Meetings Act, any citizen may come forward at this time and make comment or question on an item that appears on this agenda. Comments will be limited to three minutes per person. Anyone who would like to speak is requested, but not required to state his or her name and address for the record. Are there any citizen comments? There are no citizen comments, and we'll proceed to the consent agenda. The following consent agenda will normally be adopted without discussion. However, at the request of any citizen or council member, uh, any item may be removed from the consent agenda for council discussion. Move to approve as submitted. Thank you, Ms. Tahar. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by council member Roth. Hearing no discussion, all those in favor of approving the consent agenda as submitted signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Ayes have it and the motion carries unanimously. We move on to new business item 15-60. This is the community event Celine Fair Parade. This will be a motion to acknowledge receipt of the March 30th, 2015 memo from City Clerk Royal and to approve or not to approve the Celine Fair Parade route associated road closures and traffic control measures. Is there a motion? Move to uh, acknowledge receipt and to approve. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Rhodes. Is there a second? I'll second. Second. Seconded. Thank you, Mr. Roth. I'll get you on the next one, Ms. Dillon. Um, would you like to care to comment at all, um, Ms. Royal, or should we invite some of our friends um, from the Celine Fair Association or from the Celine Fair Board up to make comment? Okay. We have a we have a rather large contingent here. We'd welcome you to the podium if you'd like to make any comment. Hello, my name is Leslie Drake. <clears throat> um, I'm at 5890 West Waters Road. I am the committee chair for the Slim Fair Parade this year. Um, a couple years ago, we discontinued having it uptown um, due to lack of attendance and uh, funds and volunteer efforts. Um, we had a year where there wasn't anything, and then we did a couple years in the parking lot. Um, that seemed to be okay, but we had requests from um, city council and uptown businesses that wanted to see it brought back. Uh, so we entertained that notion. I uh, had a couple meetings um, with the mayor and, and some other council members. Um, it is not going to be on 12, uh, just because once you release that, it's very hard to get it back. And uh, based on construction that's going to happen next year, it didn't make sense to do it for one year and then not be able to do it the next year. So based on our brainstorming, we came up with uh, starting at Henny Field and going west to Bennett Street. So we feel that that's um, a great area for people to stand and watch. Uh, we will end up in Mill Pond Park and hopefully do some kind of mini carnival to get the public excited about the fair, which starts the next day. In past history, the Selene Fair Parade has been at the end of the fair, which was always a dilemma. So this year, it is actually the day before the fair starts so that we can get the most bang out of uh, letting the people know when and where and come join us and, and uh, join our fun. Very good. Excellent. Appreciate that. Are there any questions for our applicant? Mayor Pro Tem Rose? Um, two things. One is, uh, first I wanted to... Uh, acknowledge their fair board's ability to relook at their processes and how they do things <clears throat> and um, willingness to, to step out and do something different and the second thing is I'd like to encourage you to uh, work with the uh, police department police chief and DPW to see what could be done to reduce those potential costs coming from the city much as the um, cancer 5k run did where they were able to have a significant reduction in the costs of city fees by coming up with volunteers and doing whatever else you can. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rhodes. Any additional questions? Comments? 
Uh, Mr. Hart, please. Oh, yes, on the on the topic of fees, I was actually intending to comment that I uh, appreciated the fact that the costs, uh, the f the fees that they're asking to waive were under the amount that we estimated and approved last year. So, um, well done. Anything further? Well, let me just add, it was, it was a pleasure to sit down with you, I think, a couple months ago to discuss some alternate routes. Um, and I think, you, I think you picked a winner. Um, I think it's great that it's at the beginning of the fair and not at the end. I think you picked a great spot to start from and a great spot to end. Um, and I look forward to hopefully working with you to um, offer some amenities to folks at the end of the parade that they'll really enjoy and get them thinking about uh, the Saline Community Fair. The fair is important. Um, it celebrates our agricultural heritage, which we are more and more detached from today in 2015. Um, but that makes that, that heritage and that history no less profound. Um, so I think that the fair is, is vitally important. Um, you've done a lot of things in recent years to improve your viability and to make it more attractive. I hope that continues to be successful for you. Um, and we're glad that, that at least a component or part of the fair is back in, in the Sling community. So I appreciate that. And, um, like the mover and seconder, I'm very enthusiastic about this motion and will be supporting it. Anything else? Any comments from staff? No? Okay. Any further discussion? We appreciate your time. Thank you. Then we'll proceed to vote. It's been properly moved by Rhodes, seconded by Roth, to acknowledge and to approve. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Ayes have it. And the motion carries unanimously. Thank you all for your time this evening. We appreciate it. We move on to new business item 15-61. This is final payment for phase one wastewater treatment plant rehab. This will be a motion to acknowledge receipt of the March 2015 memo from City Superintendent Engineer Rubel and to approve or not to approve pay request number nine final in the amount of $128,658.39 as submitted. Is there a motion? Move to acknowledge receipt and approve. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Rhodes. Is there a second? Seconded by Ms. Dillon. Mr. Mr. Rubel and Mr. Rubel, uh, do you both uh, care to make comment this evening? And I know we have our, our, our superintendent, Mr. Skull, here. Bob, I don't know if you have any comment. Can you give any questions? All righty. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll start it off with, with uh, Gary Rubel, and then yeah. if Brian Rubel has any comments, yeah. uh, we, will, we, will, we welcome those. Mr. Rubel. Well, I, I can certainly... Uh, testify that uh, staff, that would include city manager and myself and Bob Skull, work diligently with Tetra Tech to resolve all the, the uh, issues with the change order number two, as you see there, the final change order, and then uh, also uh, working on the allowances uh, that were to be paid out. And Tetra Tech worked uh, diligently and uh, spent a lot of extra time <clears throat> with the uh, uh, communications uh, with the uh, contractor, FHC. and. Uh, we finally uh, did achieve uh, the goal of closing out the project, uh, addressing all the, the change order items uh, in the best interest of the city and of the project. In the packet, you'll see there's just uh, my cover memo, which is a summary of uh, past payments, the change order, and then the final payment. Uh, as I show here, the uh, uh, final payment is a sum of uh, some, some figures that come to uh, 128,000, uh, that being uh, the 6,700 in the final change order, uh, some of the number of items that are increases and decreases, and that's the balance change order. The allowance uh, uh, payout of 25,000, there was an initial one half payoff of 25,000. Digester cleaning uh, payout of 32,000, that was within the allowance, that was within the uh, bounds of the contract documents already as a pay item. And then the retainer of 64,000 that we we hold until uh, we're uh, su sufficiently satisfied that we have the warranties and uh, completion of all items. Uh, Mr. Skull submitted a memo also attesting to the operational aspects of it and, uh, and uh, the last final repair to the chiller. And then, of course, the uh, Tetra Tech uh, memo drafted by uh, Mr. Brian Rubel and uh, uh, explained to council that they completed the closeout review and at this point I recommend uh, payment of the final uh, request by the contractor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rubel. Do you care to make any comment? Or you... I, have, I have nothing more to add. I'll okay. be here for questions. Excellent. Okay. What questions do we have? We'll start with Council Member Roth. The initial contract was for 
$1,276,000. The final thing or the payment for the contract was $1,303,227.79, meaning an increase of $127,227.76. What did we get for that additional cost, and why was such a deviation made? Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I, I, the, the increase was $27,000. I, I, maybe I misunderstood you, but I thought I heard you okay. say one hundred. dollars yeah, I, I stand to be correct. Okay, uh, $27,000 increase. Uh, there were roughly 16 or 17 changes that occurred on the project. Five or six of them were deducts, that is, things that were removed from the project or done more efficiently. And the balance then were small changes that were made to the project through its duration to make something work better or we found some different conditions in the field. So the, the net change was $27,000. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Roth. Additional questions? Mr. Gearbaugh? Um, since we've had all this work done and I see there was another concern in terms of the chiller not being prepared correctly so that the pipes froze, um, knowing that we're moving into another stage of work down there, how highly likely it is that we would have this company come back and work for us? I, I think the work was, was fairly well done, actually. Uh, it was their paperwork and, and uh, loose ends, tying up loose ends, that were probably the biggest challenge. I mean, isn't this a company that released the sludge into the river? They did uh, misoperate a valve, which caused a spill into the river. So I, clearly that would be uh, your decision. To bring them back, uh, I, they did attend the pre-bid meeting, uh, so I think they will be on one of the, the bidding teams, but uh, uh, there would be a decision to be made if they were the low bidder, yes. Yeah. I, just from the concern when you said that you spent many hours working with them to get things resolved, that's my concern. That, um, And I don't know how that cost plays into this. Did we end up paying additional um, fees to your company as a result of having to work with this company? Uh, thus far, we've, we absorbed all those costs. We did not pass on any of our extra effort onto the city. Okay. So. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Gearbaugh. Any further questions? Gentlemen, thank you very much. Very well. Any additional discussion? No? Okay. It's been properly moved by Mayor Pro Tem Rhodes, seconded by Councilwoman Dillon, to acknowledge and to approve. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, say nay. Ayes have it. The motion carries unanimously. We move on to new business item 15-62. This is 2015 fee book revisions. This will be a motion to acknowledge receipt of the March 30th, 2015 memo from City Superintendent Engineer Rubel regarding fee book revisions and to approve or not to approve the revisions to the City's 2015 fee book as recommended. Is there a motion? Move to approve. Okay. I'll add acknowledge receipt as well, Mr. Rhodes. Um, it's been properly moved by Mr. Rhodes to acknowledge receipt and to approve. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councilwoman Tahar. Mr. Rubel, do you care to make any comment this evening, sir, before we open it up for questions? Thank you, Mayor. Um, I believe you have a revised uh, we do. It memo was... from the DPW regarding uh, some changes in the fee schedule due to a more recent change in the way the fringe benefits are determined and applied for DPW labor, yep. uh, labor and, and, and so forth. So uh, it has some small changes in it as shown on there, not large changes, but just small changes. And uh, Mr. Fordyce, who uh, did an excellent job here of doing the research and a number of spreadsheets to back all this up, is here in case you had any questions on any specific items. And so he did a very thorough job. And then, uh, uh, Mrs. Bennett, our treasurer, uh, also worked with uh, our uh, our plant uh, with Plant Moran, our uh, uh, auditors, and they were able to uh, determine what fairness is involved with establishing the benefits as stated in her memo of March 25th, uh, 2015. So uh, she'd probably be better one to answer those questions. Very good, uh, Ms. Bennett or Mr. Forrest, do you could make any comment at all? Uh, Okay. No comment. Okay. Any questions for any member of city staff? Mayor Pro Tem Rhodes. Under the um, meter set fees on that page, 
there's uh, for the same size meter the fees differ quite a bit depending on whether it's a turbine meter or a disc meter and I was for my own benefit wondering what the difference was between those two and why wouldn't a person just automatically select the one that is a lot less expensive and for most purposes the less expensive one um, works better uh, the turbine meter is for more of a high flow situation so a, a typical residence um, would use the disc style uh, that is good for uh, detecting low flow rates on up to a, a moderate flow rate. Turbine is for more of a high flow situation. So is it your department then that determines which meter they're going to be Correct. able to use? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Anything further, Mr. Rhodes? No, thank you. Thank you. Any additional questions for staff? No. Gentlemen, thank you. Ms. Bennett, thank you. Any subsequent discussion? Seeing none, we'll proceed to vote. It's been properly moved by Rhodes, seconded by Tahar, to acknowledge receipt and to approve. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Ayes have it. The motion carries unanimously. Move on to new business item 15-63. This is in-car computers, hardware, and installation. This will be a motion to acknowledge receipt of the March 31st, uh, 31st, yep, uh, 2015 memo from Police Chief Rennick, excuse me, and to approve or not to approve the purchase and installation of four in-car computers in the estimated amount of $14,870.29. Is there a motion to acknowledge receipt and to approve? I shall move. Thank you, Council Member Roth. Is there a second? Support. Supported by Mayor Pro Tem Rhodes. Thank you, gentlemen. Chief Rennick, do you care to make any comments, sir? I'm just prepared to answer any questions if you have any from the memo. And me memo basically describes uh, uh, our in-car computers are in very poor shape, and this is a method to uh, replace those. Any questions for Chief Rennick? Uh, Council Member Roth. What happens to the old? Is it just plainly scrapped, or is there anything to be salvaged? Well, we, we wouldn't be able to salvage them. Um, there may be um, agencies that are still continuing with those particular ones that we may be able to sell parts to. Uh, but. Uh, for the most part, they're almost useless, um, so they're probably electronically scrapped. Thank you. Any additional questions? Mayor Pro Tem Rhodes. Mine relates to that same subject matter. The Environmental Commission has annual e-waste events, and those particular items could be contributed to that, I think. As a matter of fact, because they're flat screens, they can, yes. I know the, the CRTs can, right. but, but these are flat screens, so they, yes, they would be able to be recycled. Yeah. Thank you. Anything further? Let me just say I appreciate how quickly um, this came together because I've talked to you, I've talked to some of the officers um, about how antiquated the current technology is and that, um, quite frankly, they deserve better and our citizens deserve better. Um, and it's a goal of mine, it's a goal of councils to equip our, our public safety officials with the appropriate equipment, hardware, and resources to do their jobs effectively. So I appreciate your, your work and your leadership on this and looking forward to having the new equipment installed because I think it will prove beneficial not only to our employees but also ultimately to our citizens. I agree. Okay. Thank you. Anything further? No, that's been properly moved by Roth, seconded by Rhodes to acknowledge receipt and to approve. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Ayes have it. The motion carries unanimously. We move on to new business item 15-64. This is overband crack sealing major and local streets. This will be a motion to acknowledge receipt of the March 25th memo from DPW uh, Foreman Bennett and to award or not to award the spring overband crack sealing project to Skolder, Skoldeller? Skodeller. Skodeller, excuse me, my faux pas. Um, construction in the approximate amount of 35000 and to authorize or not authorize DPW Foreman Bennett to execute acceptance of the proposal. Move to award and authorize. Thank you, Council Member Gearbaugh. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Dillon. Uh, Director Fortage, do you care to make any comment about this, sir? This is uh, just a, a continuation of our uh, crack filling efforts. It's our primary asphalt preventive maintenance uh, practice. Um, going out, cracks in the asphalt, fill them with sticky goo, water doesn't get down in there, and uh, the road lasts longer. So it's a, a very cost-effective method. And um, this uh, company has extended their um, competitively bid price from 2009 every year, so we're still paying 2009 prices for this work. Skodeller? Yeah. Okay. Very good. Any questions for Director Fordyce? No. Mr. Roth, did you have something? No, okay. I saw something percolating. I apologize. Any subsequent discussion? 
Now then we'll proceed to vote. Thank you, Mr. Fordyce. All those in favor of the motion moved by Councilmember Gearbaugh, seconded by Dillon to award and to authorize, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Ayes have it. The motion carries unanimously. We move on to new business item 15-65. This is Celine Historic Society request to install a train playset structure. This will be a motion to acknowledge receipt of the March 31st, 2015 memo from City Superintendent Engineer Rubel and to approve or not to approve the request to install a small playground style train playset at the Historic Depot Museum. Is there a motion? Move to acknowledge receipt and to approve. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Rhodes. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Tahar. I know that Mr. Rubel, you were the one who prepared a memo. I don't know if you care to comment. And then I believe former council member Peters is here representing the Historic Society. Is that correct, sir? Why don't you come up as well? And if you care to make any comment or in case there are any questions from the dais, you'll be uh, available to address those. Mr. Rubel. Thank you, Mayor. Um, <clears throat> there, uh, we do have an existing site plan for the depot, and from time to time we we do make amendments to it, and uh, the most recent one, of course, was the Velocipede Shed, which, which was a scout project. It turned out very nice. And uh, Mr. Peters and uh, the Historical Society have proposed an equally nice, nice project, especially uh, for the children, and that's the uh, train uh, play set. And uh, he, uh, he probably has a depiction of it here, of what it, of what it would look like. And uh, you, you, you've probably seen these in parks throughout Michigan, would you like me to pass this around then? Please. Start down by Mr. Gearbaugh, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, in addition to the considerations uh, in the uh, memo on, on this for council mm -hmm. consideration to approve the installation of the place set, uh, I did talk to Mr. Peters today about a couple of uh, related items, um, which you may have thought of also. Uh, one is that of the two alternatives, I think the preferred location is the one nearest uh, the livery barn because it's, it's closer to the depot building and it's probably more accessible there, more centrally located for children's use than back uh, in the far east corner that's a little harder or more difficult to uh, uh, get to. Uh, so that's the preferred location if you want to approve this as shown. Um, the other item is that we briefly discussed maintenance of the item, and uh, Mr. Peters reminded me that the Historical Society has a lease to maintain the facility, and then that this likely would fall under the, the maintenance uh, aspects of that, that lease agreement. So, uh, any questions would be... Very good. Let's start. Are there any questions for Mr. Rubel regarding his memorandum? No? Mr. Peters, do you care to make any comments, sir? Uh, just simply to say that all good museums there's a certain number of components it takes to make a good museum, and one of those that we're lacking is that's things for kids to do, hands-on type things. We get uh, young families up there with, with small kids, and they're only good for maybe 10, 15 minutes looking at displays, and they need to burn off some energy. So hopefully this will give them uh, some place to go and burn the energy off. It also keeps with our railroad uh, theme of the uh, depot, and also gives the depot uh, a full week exposure to the public, in other words, the depot is only open on Saturdays, but with this PlayStation that close to the non-motorized trail, it sort of gives a train-themed depot connection to the public all week long. Very good. Any questions for uh, Mr. Rubel or our applicant? No? Any discussion? Comments? Uh, start with uh, Mayor Pro Tem Rhodes, and then we'll move to Mr. Gearbaugh. I just wanted to say that I, I strongly support the uh, position of the playset showing closest to the livery barn. Um, it, it, keeps everything a little bit more compact and while the one to the far east uh, appears just as visible it, it really isn't when it's tucked off on the side there so right thank you thank you mr rhodes mr gearbaugh um two things i agree the where the location is and being talking with the board and everything that it's seen better from the road so that if any potential issues or things concern our police officers or so forth can see it um since i'm a tre i'm the treasurer for the society i will be abstaining from voting on it just to keep it clean Thank you. Mr. Roth? I just want to mention this, this problem is not going to cost the city anything. It's just the okay. Right. We're not here position. asking for any money, just permission. Correct. Yes. Anything further? I just think this is great. Appreciate your leadership on this. I think it's a great addition to the, the depot site. It is essentially one of our parks, and I think it makes it uh, a little bit more inclusive and inviting to, to people of all ages. So good work on this. 
If there's nothing further, we'll proceed to vote. All those in favor of the motion that's been moved by Rhodes, seconded by Tahar, to acknowledge receipt and to approve, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. And one abstention. Correct, Mr. Gearbaugh? Thank you, sir. The motion carries. We move on to new business item 14-238. Um, this is state revolving fund resolution. This will be a motion to acknowledge receipt of the April 1st, 2015 memo from Treasurer Bennett and to approve or not to approve the resolution for subsequent notice of intent to borrow in the amount of 400,000 for the construction of phase two of the wastewater treatment plant. Is there a motion? Move to approve. Can we add acknowledge receipt as well, Ms. Oh, Tahar? Yes. Thank you, ma'am. It's been moved by Ms. Tahar to acknowledge receipt and to approve. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Gearbaugh. Ms. Bennett, the floor is yours. Okay, I'd like to start off by saying this is a precautionary measure only. As you may recall, in December, we um, proposed a resolution to borrow 3.2 for the phase two of the water treatment plant. We have met with Tetra Tech and um, with the, the final projected, you know, what they're anticipating the bids to come in at. Um, as I stated in my memo, we're at 3.267665. When we were preparing documentation to proceed with the, the process, our um, legal counsel and bond counsel wanted to make sure that we were pretty firm on that number because we were 3.2 was the maximum in our resolution and so that anything that came in over higher than that would have to come out of out of pocket. Now Tetra Tech has advised us that we have $300,000 principal forgiveness from the state of Michigan but we would have to bond the full cost. We've also been advised by bond council, legal council and Tetra Tech that because of the economic pickup bids are starting to come in a little higher and I sort of started getting nervous and said, what if we don't have enough in the resolution to borrow against? We have to borrow the full amount of the project, and then this MDOT would give us that 300000 forgiveness, but we have to have the resolution to borrow all of that. So this is a precautionary measure. Anything that um, the, the, bond, the bid would actually have to come to you for approval, and then when we do the bond issuance, you know, how much we would fund is to be subject, but this is just a precautionary measure to um, protect us so that we have the ability, should the bonds come in or something else unforeseen happen. Very good. Any questions for Ms. Bennett? No? How about uh, comments or discussion? Mr. Rhodes. Uh, not for Ms. Bennett. <coughs> Thank you, ma'am. No? Um, is this next phase of the wastewater treatment plant work going to eliminate the odor issues that come up from time to time or at least reduce their frequency and uh, quantity? There is a component of the project to help Mr. Skull rehabilitate the existing odor control equipment that is there. But there is not any new containment per se uh, as part of the project. So hopefully with that repair he'll be able to use that equipment more frequently and more efficiently. What, what would it take to make sure that that we did have that odor problem? I, I have not been charged to study that odor problem in any detail, so I, I can't give you a, a scientific explanation for that. But I have been asked to help repair that existing device, and that is part of the project. If I may piggyback on that, yes. Mr. Rubel, um, I, let me preface by saying I'm all in favor of providing additional resources to rehab the equipment that's already in, in our inventory to address odor control. Um, but I, I, I concur with Mr. Rhodes that at a minimum this, this dais, this body should think about perhaps at least exploring some other alternatives because we have been made aware um, in, in very emphatic terms that we have had some pretty profound issues of, of late. Um, and I'm not a resident of, of that particular sure. vicinity, um, but if I was, I'd, I'd be alarmed and upset and, and be of the opinion that at least to a certain extent it, it shouldn't be tolerated and that some steps, some aggressive and assertive steps should be taken to see what we can do to address that. I, I'd be more than happy to meet with your staff and figure okay. out a, a step in that direction. Okay, so. very good. Mr. Gearbaugh? My question with the pollution aspect or the odor aspect is, um, it seemed to be working fine for a while until we started doing this renovation. And 
it really became more prevalent in the last, oh, I don't know, year or so. The concern is if we go back to where we were, but I'm again concerned is if we go into our next phase, how much worse will it be at that point? So it's really understanding just how much it is impacted by just the, reno the renovations and things that we're doing. Because I don't know why all of a sudden it was in the last year it became worse except for whatever the new company was doing and whatever construction was happening. Yeah, I, ha I have talked to your staff a few times about that. And, you know, other than a few weeks perhaps during construction, nothing that was performed should have changed the odor uh, coming from the plant. I, you know, what perhaps maybe then it points to some other atmospheric type conditions. But as far as the operation of the plant, long term, the phase one project should not have changed the characteristics. Why don't we proceed in, in this direction unless I hear objections? This seems perfectly appropriate and reasonable to have Mr. Rubel meet with some of our staff members to determine what else potentially could be done to rectify the odor issue. Is there any objection to having staff sit down with Mr. Rubel and or his associates at Tetra Tech? No. Okay. Be happy to. Great. Yeah. Appreciate that. Um, why don't you stay up here just in case there are any other questions, Mr. Rubel. Um, is there anything further related to this motion? Mr. Roth, please. When this <coughs> part is completed, what else is there left to be done? That's, I, yeah, your plant's quite old. Um, clearly, there's uh, you know other improvements in the future. Uh, you know, there are some mechanisms that we are replacing in this project, but there are, are some mechanisms that have been in place for 20, 30 years and will continue to be in place. So, at some point, some of that equipment will need to be replaced. You have pumping systems that are largely not being. Uh, I don't know of any problem with them, but pumps just need to be replaced every 20, 25 years. Those are not being done as part of this project. So there's a fair amount of infrastructure that's still there, but I, I, will, I do not know of any immediate needs that would take place after this project. So this will be the last phase for some time? I think that's very fair to say that, yes. Well, we were brought out as consul several years ago and visit the site. And there are several things we pointed out pretty much in the physical structure of the building itself and the grounds around it. And it appears both of these phases didn't address any of those particular issues. Where do we go from here? They have that it is a very up-to-date, respectable facility for our city. Uh, again, we could, we could lay out a, a phase three. We, we have just laid out the first uh, five years, roughly, that this, this is what this project was supposed to be. So at, at, I think your next step would be to look beyond that five year cycle and, and develop a new plan. Anything further, Mr. Roth? Well, I was just wondering, I was ho hoping that within these phases we had, some of these issues would have been addressed. Well, I, I, again, I don't know what all your concerns were. Many of them will be addressed, as I recall. Uh, we have some failing concrete that will be addressed. It will really make part of that site uh, look quite a bit better aesthetically. And this phase two is pretty important. Uh, it will replace your filtering system, which is essentially the very last process before it discharges to the river. And that has been deteriorating, that performance of that system. So this, this will give you a great safeguard uh, with meeting your your permit obligations. Right. Will this last phase include changing where we receive septics from a, a third party? Yeah, the, that, that whole complex is being replaced as part of this project. So that will extend your, the lifespan of that operation at your plant for, gosh, 20, 30 more years. And will some of the equipment left behind from previous renovations and this current renovation be removed from the site? This contract, uh, it was part of our study pl phase to evaluate that. And there was, unfortunately, not a lot of extra funds to take care of those improvements. But I believe Mr. Skull has programmed that into his, his budget to get that done concurrently. He has. Thank you. Yeah. 
And let me just say, Councilmember Roth, I, I agree with you that um, when, we, when we took a tour of the facility um, several years back, there were a number of, of, of deficiencies and issues that, that needed to be resolved and needed to be resolved uh, expeditiously. Uh, and like Mr. Rubel said, I think with the completion of phase two, most of those issues will be rectified. There will still be some lingering um, issues and, and problems that will need to be addressed and certainly council and, and staff along with other stakeholders will be talking about that in, in the coming years. So your, your point is, is, is very well taken and certainly work will continue to rehab and modernize the facility in, in the years ahead. That's correct. If there's nothing further then, Brian, appreciate your time You're this evening. Welcome. We will uh, we'll proceed to vote. It's been properly moved by Tahar, seconded by Gearbach to acknowledge the receipt and to approve. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Ayes have it. The motion carries unanimously. We move on to new business item 15 68. This is a resolution in support of proposal one for safer roads. This will be a motion to approve or not to approve the resolution in support of proposal one for safer roads. Is there a motion? Move to approve. Thank you, Mr. Tahar. Is there a second? Support. Support by Mayor Pro Tem Rhodes. Um, any comments, any discussion? Um, obviously, I don't want to <laughs> belabor the point because we had a pretty thorough, um, all-encompassing presentation by, by Representative Zemke. Um, I prepared this, uh, this resolution um, several weeks ago. It's modeled, um, not identically, but very closely to sample language that we prov were provided by MML. It has been reviewed by our legal counsel, um, and I did actually, because she is quite the wordsmith, I did have uh, Councilwoman Tahar take a look at it and offer some suggestions as well. So I'm very pleased with how it turn out, turned out. Um, let me just say this. Um, a former employer, former boss of mine, State Representative Jeff Irwin, was talking about this issue on Off the Record on PBS probably about two or three weeks ago, and I think he summed it up appropriately where he said, you're going to pay either way. Do you want to pay a little bit more up front for better roads, or do you want to, to pay when you're in a terrible accident on one of our state or, or local roads? Because if we don't start to infuse our, our, our inventory, our, uh, our, our, our infrastructure systems with, with cash, um, those types of statistics are only going, to, uh, only going to escalate. And that was enumerated, actually, in Representative Zemke's um, PowerPoint. So um, this is far from a perfect proposal, but um, I, I deal with realities and numbers, and, and quite frankly, I think this is the best that we're going to get out of this particular legislature. So um, needless to say, I wouldn't have put it on the agenda if I wasn't in support of it, and uh, I enthusiastically uh, support this motion and hope that you will join me um, in voicing your support as well. Any additional comments? Ms. Tahar. Um, but perhaps a, a slightly more cynical take. Um, um, I also support uh, the resolution. I, uh, my support for the, the uh, proposal has not been a given. Um, so I've been thinking about it a lot. And uh, I think back to 1987 when I moved back to Michigan from North Carolina. And in 1987, I was appalled at the condition of the roads in the state, and they have not improved. Um, and I, I believe we must take action, and I believe if we do not pass Proposal 1, um, what comes next will be much, much, much worse. So um, I'm supporting it partly from that kind of cynical point of view. Thank you, Mr. Hart. Additional comments? No? You want to comment? Please, Mayor Pro Tem Rhodes. Um, I'm just going to say Representative Zemke's um, presentation here made me uh, more aware of the cost of not doing anything that $8.1 billion per year in the state as a result of the costs associated with bad roads, the accidents, crashes that occur, and all of those subsequent costs. That's pretty eye-opening. And... Um, you know, to paraphrase Winston Churchill, this may not be the best written, but it's better than anything else that's out there. So I, I support it. Thank you, sir. Any additional comments? Uh, Mr. Hart, please. Yeah, when, one other thing, anecdotally, um, my husband and I purchased a new car in January, and for the first time in my life and or my experience, um, it's a new car. The, the dealer offered us uh, an insurance policy on our wheels and rims, mm. which we purchased because of the bad conditions of the road in the state. 
Thank you for that. <laughs> I think. <laughs> well, it's ju just as an indication of no, how bad it, it is. It's anecdotal, but I, I think it's absolutely indicative. Yeah, appreciate you sharing that. Anything further? No, then we'll proceed to vote. It's been properly moved by Tahar, seconded by Rhodes to approve. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Nay. Ayes have it, and the motion carries. We move on to new business item 15-69. This is Quantum Signal Lease Agreement. This is a motion to acknowledge receipt of the April 2nd, 2015 memo from City Manager Campbell and to approve or not to approve the license agreement between the City of Saline and Quantum Signal for the use of city property as a product testing site and to authorize or not authorize Mayor Marl and Clerk Royal to sign the lease agreement. Is there a motion? Move to approve and authorize. Thank you, Mr. Gearbaugh. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by... Ms. Dillon. Mr. Campbell, do you care to comment at all? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and you, you summed it up pretty well, but in, in uh, Mitch Road, um, the uh, owner of Quantum Signal is here for any questions. But um, we were approached, uh, Mitch approached staff, uh, I think it was this past summer, uh, looking, f and they were working on some, some possible future projects um, that they were bidding on, and if they were able to win those contracts, that they would need some some area to do some product testing. And I know in the past they've used like the high school parking lot and those types of things, and uh, looking for something different. And these are um, some, some I don't, I'll let, I don't want to give away trade secrets or anything like that. So I <laughs> so but 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 you fancy can, robots. Fa there you go, fancy robots uh, testing. And as we looked at this poten potential sites. Um, the, the three vacant parcels out at uh, adjacent parcels at Sauk Trail Business Park, uh, lots 18, 19, and 20. Um, and he just said, hey, these, this would be a great location for what we need to test for. Um, and so um, uh, we, um, they submitted a, a request uh, a few months ago, uh, a couple months ago, and so we worked in drafting some agreement language for the city attorney's office. And what you have before you is, is, is what has been drafted as far as it's a, so it's a 18, 18 month term and um, uh, with a upfront cost. And so, but there's both, both part, either party could, could of course um, uh, discontinue the agreement if, if need be. And for instance, if we were to s sell the property, um, then that, so then we would prorate and we would return the balance if it was less than 18 months. Um, but we, we think this is some, a, a way to certainly assist uh, one of our, our, our better corporate citizens that uh, we enjoy working with. So, If there are no questions for the city manager, uh, Mitch, I'll turn it over to you, man. Sure. Uh, you know, as, uh, as most of you guys know that I represent Quantum Signal, we develop a lot of products. We're up the street here. Uh, some of our products are fancy robots, as I said there, and autonomous vehicle technology. Um, we, as, as part of moving downtown Saline, uh, we're very excited to be downtown. Obviously, one of the challenges is the ability to test outdoor vehicles uh, when you're in a downtown space. Um, when it comes to things like autonomous vehicles that can be on road, we were very happy to receive the first autonomous vehicle license plates last year, approximately a year ago this, this week, actually, from the state of Michigan. So if we want to test those things on road, we can use actually the streets to do that. But when it comes to off-road robots, which is something that uh, military robots and other things are, are very concerned about. Uh, you kind of need something that's more like a grassy field, something with some hills, that sort of thing. And so um, when we looked at this particular project we're working on and some other projects, we thought that perhaps it would be nice to, rather than try to drive far away from Saline and try to find other property, it would be nice to be right here in Saline up the block and try to do something on unused space. And uh, as part of that, we thought it would, be, it would be great to be able to, you know, put a little bit of money toward the city of Saline just to reimburse them for the cost of working with us on this thing and to uh, hopefully they can take, you guys can take that money and put it towards something useful. And, uh, and so, you know, just here tonight to answer any questions um, about the project or about the, uh, the request here uh, about the project to some extent. And, uh, and I'm happy to answer anything you'd like. Very good. Are there any questions for the applicant? No? Okay. no glad we can be of service for you. <laughs> thank, thank you very much for hearing me out. And next time when you're on the agenda, we'll put you at the beginning of new business so you don't have to uh, stick around for an additional hour. I don't mind at all, Brian. It's, it's democracy at work, and it's a pleasure. Okay. Well, we appreciate that. We appreciate your, your, your leadership and, like the city manager said, for being a, a very um, valued and special corporate citizen. Thank you. 
Any subsequent discussion? No, that has been properly moved by Gearboss, seconded by Dillon, to approve and to authorize. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Ayes have it. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you again. We move on to discussion items. First up, we have commission, committee, and task force reports from council members. Anything, Mr. Rhodes? Um, on behalf of the Environmental uh, Commission, I want to remind everybody of our electronic waste recycling event on Saturday, April 25 here in the City Hall parking lot. Starts at 9 o'clock in the morning and goes till 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And it was, as was mentioned earlier, unfortunately we cannot accept cathode ray tube devices, the older televisions and uh, the older computer monitors. Uh, however, the county will be doing a cleanup event at DPW later on uh, this year and they will accept those kind of devices. That's a change that we had to make because of um, changing uh, providers, vendors with this recycling thing and uh, the vendors are not getting the subsidy that they used to get. Um, the Environmental Commission is also working with the Parks Commission. We're going to try and uh, develop some plantings down in the dog park to help uh, control any runoff uh, into the mill pond. And uh, let's see, don't need to say anything else about parks because that was all covered earlier this evening and y'all remember that, right? Indeed. Okay. Uh, the schools are going to do a, um, a waste reduction special effort the week of April the 20th and uh, in the elementary schools. And so they have asked for volunteers to uh, help with during the lunch periods. So this is primarily uh, food waste reduction that they're going to work on to start with. And then Pleasant Ridge on uh, April 24th, I believe it is, is trying to um, totally eliminate any waste coming out of their building on that day. Okay. All kinds. So they're to be applauded for their efforts. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Rhodes. Additional Commission Committee or Task Force reports. Ms. Tahar, please. Um, thank you. The Arts and Culture Committee met today um, and we are moving forward uh, on two collaborations, um, one with the Historical, so Historical Society and the other with uh, Parks and Recreation that you'll be hearing more about. <laughs> this is, this uh, goes along with one of our goals that we had set for ourselves was to find uh, collaboration partners within the community and that's working out very well. Great, thank you. Additional, uh, Mr. Roth, please. Yeah, this Sunday, the Saline Historical Society will have a speaker. Or excuse me, not this Sunday. The next, next, be next Sunday that we have. Uh, that's coming up this Sunday. Jim, Jim Peters will be making a presentation about our German heritage in this area. So he's going to share some information that probably many of us be of interest to it. It's free. It's going to be held in a bracket room at two o'clock next Sunday or this coming Sunday at 2 p.m. Very good. Anything else on commission, committee, or task force reports? Mr. Gearbaugh? Um, we were able to, Historic District Commission is able to fill one position with Ron Koenig, so he begins um, on our first meeting that's now being moved to the first Wednesday of the month. And But we still have one position still open, so if anyone's still interested, please submit an application. Very good. Anything further? How about reports or other announcements? Mr. Rhodes. The um, Saline District Library on April the 19th, that's a Sunday at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, will have a formal dedication for their outdoor art work, the Wild Bird um, facility that's out there. It's quite lovely. And um, I believe they're going to have free ice cream also, so that might bring out some more, How about that? more young people. And um, the other thing I had was I, I saw a notice today that the city of Saline has been selected as the 11th best city in the state for young families. So it's another another recognition for our fine community. Very good. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Rhodes. Uh, I have one announcement. I actually provided the, the material to the city clerk. You, you can actually keep it in your file. Um, I received a letter this past week from Leslie Needhammer, the director of the Saline District Library, with a annual report and an annual audit. Um, obviously, it goes without saying that's a very well-run organization. It's a great community resource. A lot of dedicated volunteers and staff members make that the exceptional facility it is. If you want to take a look at their financial um, information, she provided that to me and asked that I share it with the rest of my colleagues on council. So that will be in the clerk's office if you're interested in taking a look at it. 
Are there any other reports or announcements? No, then we move on to city industrial property. I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Campbell, but I would refer to a memo that you provided to us um, in our packet. I believe it's dated March the 31st. Correct. Yeah, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Rubel, Rubel provided it. Excuse me. Correct. Yep. As well, it's city staff is a, uh, a collaborative effort between uh, the assessor's office, engineering department, and uh, city manager's office to put this together. But um, city was approached a little while ago, uh, MMI in the former ThyssenKrupp building there, um, just south of of um, um, the rec center on uh, Woodland. Um, they're wanting to expand significantly. Um, approximately 50,000 square feet. However, with because of the maximum lot uh, coverage in our zoning ordinance, um, they would um, be exceeding the lot coverage uh, tremendously, in which would require a potential variance. And of course, as we all know, I mean, variances aren't, aren't automatic by any stretch of the imagination. Um, so staff, I think, came up with a, a, a very um, solid idea. There's a, a about a 1.03 plus or minus acres. Um, that's more or less a, a I, I guess, a buffer, but a property that's not buildable, that's contiguous, and it's essentially, in, and as you can see on the, the layout that, that we provided, it's um, uh, contiguous uh, between, but kind of the S curve there, as I call it, uh, by the by the ball fields at, at Teff Park, and um, where MMI is currently located. Um, Again, that property is is of, is of no use to the city. Um, it's not buildable. It's one point. So the, the thought would be to um, consider s offering that to sell that uh, piece of property, the little over one acre to them, which would they would still exceed um, uh, the uh, maximum lot coverage, but only by about five or six percent, which would be a much more palatable, I believe, variance request. Um, so. Uh, but in any case, um, so that, that's why I wanted to bring it up to see if, if council was supportive of that. And of course, the, the you know what would be the value, the value that our assessor, as you can see from the, the um, memo from Catherine Scholar, the assessor, uh, the value um, at uh, eleven thousand one hundred seventy-seven dollars. And of course, it's it's greatly discounted because it is not buildable. Um, so. Uh, but I get, believe it's a 75% discount rate applied to that. So um, want, staff is essentially um, wanting to see if, if council has an interest in moving forward to f for staff to work with. Uh, uh, it's actually MMI actually leases that property, but with the, with the owners of that property. Let me open it up first to uh, council members who have questions for Mr. Campbell or Mr. Rubel. Um, Ms. Skull, of course, is not here this evening, but I'm sure Mr. Campbell can address some questions on her behalf. Are there any questions for city staff regarding this issue? Mr. Gearbaugh? And there was never any plan in historically to have that as an access to any of that property to the west of it? It just seems weird that we kept a, a narrow track like that that almost yeah. looks like it's a potential road. Yeah, I, I'm not a, sell it with that property that was already there. I I just was curious if there was sure. anything that was for future planning. Do you want to address that, Mr. Rubel? Can you address that? Um, I think part of the reason is the fact that it's uh, I believe it's north of the the section line itself of the section of Pittsfield Township that was the Teff property to the south that was made into industrial park. And so this was a piece of property that actually lied between uh, the remainder of what was uh, set aside for industrial park and, and uh, left over from the section to the north that we purchased from the Teff uh, uh, family also. And that became dedicated as recreation area. Um, there was no plan on record with the industrial park plans or the plat plan for it to be a connector road going to the west. So it really was just a boundary issue thing when we bought yeah, a problem. Right. Okay. No, I think, I think that's part of the problem. The other part was that uh, underneath that <clears throat> piece of land, basically there's a very uh, wide easement for the underground BP oil or BP gas line, which takes jet fuel to uh, fueled uh, dispensary stations in the metro area. 
So a majority of it can't be built upon for, for that reason also because it's a, at least 50 foot is a, a pipeline easement. That makes more sense. Pipeline. Thanks. That answers the question. Any other questions? Well, let's see if we can develop some consensus. I can start it off. I, um, I enthusiastically support um, staff moving forward. I think it's great that MMI is, um, is willing to expand their footprint in Saline. Um, that's obviously our goal. We always want to see our businesses, both large and small businesses of a commercial, um, commercial enterprises and industrial, um, grow and thrive in this community. And if we can help them out by selling some property that is um, of no real value to us, um, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's a win-win. So I'm um, interested in hearing what, what my colleagues think. Want to start off, Mr. Gearbaugh? Oh, sure. No, I'm fine. Put it back on property tax rolls and we'll get some more income off it. Okay. Mr. Rhodes? I fully support entering into negotiation with MMI on this property. Okay. Mr. Har? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Mr. Roth? I'm in support. Very good. Ms. Dillon? I'm in support. Okay. Do you feel like you have sufficient direction then? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Hopefully we'll have something tangible to report in the very near future. Thank you all. Um, last but certainly not least on the agenda this evening, and there's also, I believe, a corresponding memo from Dickinson Wright on this. Um, actually dated today, April the 1st, uh, rail ra railroad cars. Um, do you want to kick this one off? Sure, and Chief, I kind of asked ask the Chief to, uh, to, to address this, but yes, I mean, we, we, I mean, obviously, we've, the last has been there now for what, maybe three weeks a month, the, uh, the rail cars, and, and so, of course, a lot of um, questions and comments, and, and so uh, we just wanted to, to bring this you know to council and and so so the public could, could know um that unfortunately 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 there's not a lot we can do um but again that's that's why part of the the uh, the reason for the um attorney's opinion uh, but also i know chief has had some discussions with with folks at, at ann arbor railroad as well yeah as a matter of fact over the weekend uh, uh chris shank uh, uh, texted me and let me know that somebody on facebook had actually sent him the question about what are, what's going to be done with those rail cars. Um, and I had sent a memo, memo to uh, Mr. Campbell, and I talked to a, a gentleman by the name of John Vance, and his title is Train Master. I'm not exactly sure what that means, but it sounds pretty important, uh, <laughs> over at the Ann Arbor Railroad. And he says all the cars are empty that are, that are sitting there. Uh, they have not been cleaned, uh, so, they, so um, there is, like there could be vapor or something like that in there, but as far as quantity, there was nothing in there. He says they are going to be parked there in what he termed as um, a deep storage, which means they're going to be there for a long period of time. Uh, and I asked him if there were any, you know, qualifiers, anything, is there a time limit of any kind? And he says, no, it's, you know, it's Ann Arbor Railroad property and they can use that for storage from now until whenever. Um, and so I, I, I told him about the, the concerns that our citizens are having about those vehicles or those cars being parked there. And he said he would see what he could do to have those uh, cars pulled a little bit further to the east so they're at least not visible uh, from uh, Maple Road. Uh, but that has not occurred as of yet, but he said he will try to get that done. But as far as any type of enforcement or forcing them to move them, uh, we have no authority whatsoever to do that. Right. Okay. Any comments, questions? Mr. Rose? I think the economics might eventually force them to do something with that because there's several million dollars worth of equipment just sitting there. Anything further? I, Mr. Har? Um, I just wanted to say I appreciate the fact that, that um, we turn to the city attorney for um, clarification of, of what we could or could not do. Not necessarily the answer we would have liked to have, but, but it's good to have that clarification. Sure. Anything further? Chief, appreciate it. Thank you. Yep. Anything further from you? No, well, I, I was just going to add, and, and unfortunately, in another community I was in previously, we had similar um, discussions slash uh, battles. <laughs> so, um, but but yeah, I wanted to make sure that to, to, to so everybody knew that that we've done what we can do at, to this point. So, very good. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. If there's nothing further. Uh, oh, yes, Mr. Rhodes. Uh, I, my apologies there, uh, Mayor Morrill. I should have brought this up earlier, but I wanted to mention that I participated in MML Economic Development and Land Use uh, Committee this morning up in Lansing. Uh, we developed positions on 11 bills that are working their way through either the House or the Senate. 
uh, some in support, some of opposed to, and then we had discussions on three items that have not yet generated any new bills, but they're in that, that preliminary process. So um, the agenda that I had with me, I marked all up with notes, but I did take another one and clean it up and just circled whether we supported or opposed. So if there are people here who would like that, maybe actually I'll give that. Provide that the clerk and she can make copies clerk. and put them in everyone's right. mailboxes. Yeah, and then if um, any of you all have questions or concerns about the positions we took, if you wanted to contact me, I could give you more Great. explanation about why we did what we did. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Appreciate that. Appreciate your service on that, that subcommittee. Anything further? No, then we'll proceed to the second public comment period. Under the Open Meetings Act, any citizen may come forward at this time and make comment or question to City Council. This public comment period will be limited to three minutes per person. Anyone who would like to speak is requested but not required to state his or her name and address for the record. Are there any citizen comments? Any other business to come before the City Council this evening? But well, please note our upcoming uh, work meetings and regular meetings, as well as a special meeting on the 27th of this month. Um, we already excused the absence of Councilwoman Cybo Koenig, so we will dispense with that. And at this time, the Chair would seek a motion to adjourn this regular City Council meeting at 9.05 p.m. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Gearbaugh. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Dillon. All those in favor of adjourning, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you all.